someone. We'll sing it through twice. Humble thyself in the sight of the Lord. Humble thyself in the sight of the Lord.
Unfortunately, it's really easy to get caught up with what's going on all around us. Um, I realize there's something about Actually, I know people that drive in traffic regularly in a big city. They say they never look at their speedometer. They just get on the freeway and drive with the flow of traffic. Well, okay. That's, you know. I read somewhere where the average speed on an Atlanta freeway was 80 miles an hour during rush hour. So, you know, okay. But all that aside, while that might be fine for getting us through traffic, we need to make sure that we don't get caught up in everything that's going on around us till the point where it influences and hurts our witness for the Lord Jesus Christ. Now, we are not called to isolate ourselves from the world in which we live. Jesus said we are the salt of the earth, and that means we are to be the seasoning that lives in the world. But this passage also teaches us that when our lives has been changed by the blood of Jesus Christ, there is a difference in how we live. There is a difference in how we interact with those around us. And that's where this verse comes. It says, be careful how you live, not as unwise, but as wise, making the most of the time. Does anyone really want to be considered foolish? But I don't think anyone likes to be known or classified as foolish. Let me tell you, I've seen people do a lot of foolish things. And it's, it's tragically how many of those foolish things I've been visiting them in the hospital because of some stupid thing that someone did. Now, I've never told them it was a stupid thing they were doing. Let me assure you of that. You pray for them. <laughs> you know, why did you do that? What did you think? You know, uh, kind of like that old Jay Leno portion of the show that says, uh, he, he used to have one called, What Did You Think Was Going to Happen? And sometimes you look at people and you say, What did you think was going to happen? I used to cringe when we would go to Yellowstone Park. And inevitably, you'd be standing along the fence by the Grand Canyon of the Yellowstone. And I mean, it is a long way down. It's a steep cliff. And inevitably, you'd see someone with a little kid sitting on their shoulder so they could see over the fence. Or someone holding the baby out over it. You know, and you just want to say, wake up, folks. Don't do that. Well, as much as we can do that, and we can observe that, how much care do we take to maintain our relationship with the Lord Jesus Christ? Or how many times do we get so caught up in the flow of what's going on around us that our witness becomes of almost no value? Hey, we'll do things with a crowd of people that we'd never do otherwise. Just go to a football game. It can even be a high school football game. Get a crowd of people. Let a referee do some mistake. All of a sudden, you have lots of people, you know. Uh, I, I still remember when I was in college, I had gone with my roommate uh, to the New Hampshire State Basketball Final Playoffs. His high school was in. Now, I didn't know anyone in that high school, but I was with a whole bunch of people from Claremont. Well, here's a bunch. The referee did a really, really stupid thing. We all watched it. He, uh, the ball went out of bounds. Well, that means the other team gets the ball. It was clearly out of bounds. It was almost up to the stand. The referee went over with his foot, kicked the ball back into play, and the team that knocked it out scored a basket. Well, in the midst of the booze and the, you know, everything else, I remember I said, there's a lot of things a blind man can do nowadays, but being a referee at a basketball game isn't one of them. <laughs> uh, of course, I didn't know, uh, I happened to be sitting in front of the uh, booth, and when we got back to my roommate's house that night, his sister said, Greg, was that your big mouth I heard? <laughs> <laughs> Oops. <laughs> yeah, well, it might have been. <laughs> but all that aside, the point is, we would never do something like that if we weren't caught up in a crowd of people. 
Now, at a basketball game, it adds enthusiasm. That's one of the things they said at these Olympics that were just over. Some of the participants had a hard time because of the lack of crowds there and those cheering them on. Okay. That might be fine for a sporting event. But listen, when it comes to our walk with Jesus, if we are walking in such a way that we are following the crowd with what's around us, instead of following what his word has to say to us, we are going to find ourselves in big trouble. Wisdom, by definition in this passage, is doing what God wants us to do. Foolishness is ignoring what God wants us to do. This passage says, don't be foolish. By the way, there's a big difference between knowledge and wisdom. Knowledge is learning things and retaining facts. And over the years, I've encountered individuals who know lots of things about the Word of God. They know. They could probably quote Scripture better than I could but have never applied the truth to their hearts. That's knowledge, not wisdom. Wisdom is taking what we know about the things of God and applying it to how we live. And if we're not applying it, it's kind of like, you know, I can respect a literature professor who can give a lecture on Shakespeare or, you know, any great writer you want to take. That's good. They have lots of knowledge. But someone who only knows what Scripture says without applying it to their heart is just like someone who studies Shakespeare or Dickens or any other great writer. Why? It's knowledge. Wisdom is learning how to apply it. We're called to be wise in the Lord. Sometimes, how do we become wise? Steady God's Word. Walking in the light of the Spirit. First, giving our heart to Jesus in salvation. But, beyond that, hey, I know we live in a world that is not always nice. But we are called to walk in the light of the direction Jesus has. Unfortunately, I think some people take this and go the wrong way and think they can somehow arrive at salvation by doing a whole list of works or things like that. And guess what? It doesn't work that way. I was reading a writer this week, and I love the way he put it. He said, in the Old Testament, there were very specific rules that said, you shall do this, you won't do that, you shall do this. So we come to the New Testament, it's more of Jesus gave us principles that we are to live by, that tells us how to respond in different situations. And when you think about that, that's true. It's, it's pretty hard sometimes to have an exact set of rules that's <clears throat> going to apply to every single situation. There's going to be some times where we need to just respond to what Jesus tells us to do. But we're not going to know what he wants us to do if we don't spend time getting to know him. We become, think about this for a minute, we have a tendency to become like those that we hang around with. We have a tendency to become like those that we hang around with. Now, that doesn't mean we isolate ourselves from anyone who's not a Christian. I would never, because we are the ones that have the responsibility of sharing our witness with that person. But, if we know someone is causing us to do things in our life 
which we would believe are contrary to what Jesus would want us to do, we better make sure we know who we're following and what track we're on. It's foolishness to be called into someone else's track. We need to make sure that we are using the time wisely. Hey, I don't need to say with everything going on in the world around us, I know some don't like it. You say, well, that's a sign that the end times are coming, that Jesus is about to come. No, I personally believe it is. But all that aside, when we just see all these things going on around us, hey, a lot of people got cut off, caught up in a very short amount of time. We don't know what the future holds for any one of us. And I don't mean that in a negative way. But we need to make sure that we are using the time that we are given wisely so we can truly follow the wisdom that he has for us. As I was reading this week, another commentator pointed out three characteristics, practices of the early church that were done and acknowledged in this passage of scripture. And maybe if we would learn to apply those things to our lives, we could find ourselves growing closer to him day by day. The first characteristic, they talk in this church about singing. Now, I think that's a good thing. I think it, in this sense of the passage, it involves the whole concept of we need to be a people of worship. How we worship is going to vary. What? Not everyone likes to worship in the same way. That's okay. But the bottom line is, a people who are seeking wisdom are a people who worship. And I know there are some times that beyond our control we need to worship at home by ourselves. But I know that as a whole we need the fellowship of other believers. And we need that time set aside to focus on the things of God. I mean, let's be honest. How many times do you really try to pray about something and you're at home and all of a sudden the phone rings, the dog barks, you name it, you fill in the blank, whatever. It's something, there's anything to distract us. We need time to be a people of worship who focus on the principles that God wants us to live by. Tragically, I think a lot of people have tried to minimize the importance of worship with what's happened over the last year or so in our country. But let me tell you, if we're going to grow wise, we need to spend time in worship. The early church was a thankful church. We need to be people of thanksgiving, thanking God for what he has done for us, recognizing his goodness to us. You know, I heard someone on the news this week made a statement that really troubled me. They were making this statement, and I know it's an unfortunate time for, for many people, but when this lady learned that she might be evicted because she hadn't paid her rent for a year and a half, she said, well, housing is my right. No. Housing, I mean, yeah, we should care about someone who's living on the street. I acknowledge that. But let me tell you, even the caveman had to find the cave and clean it out. They didn't just pray for their food to come into them. They had to go gather it and hunt it. Listen, we need to be thankful for what God provides for us. And I know that God reaches down in ways beyond what we could ever ask or think and provides. But... We need to learn to be a thankful people. And we live in a day and time when people, I don't know, they almost seem to think other people owe them a living, and some people think, seem to think that God owes them. And guess what? God doesn't owe us anything. We owe Him our love and our service. But when we surrender to Him, he does meet all our needs graciously, but we need to thank Him and acknowledge 
what He has done for us. The early church was a place where men honored and respected one another. And by the way, that's something that has to go well beyond worship. If you, there's a person, now we don't have to like what someone is doing. We don't have to like how someone is living. But let me tell you, if they don't sense that we honor and respect them as a person, anything we share with them about Jesus goes right out the other side. Why? Because people need to know that they're cared about. I think we all know over the years some people have been criticized that they preached for someone to arrive at salvation so they could keep track of how many souls they went to the Lord. That's not how it works, folks. <laughs> we need to preach for people to come to know Jesus because they need to know Jesus. I've often thought of the work of missionaries and our, our denomination has missionaries in both countries. But um, I was thinking for years on the island of Haiti, the church has been growing faster than the district superintendents can keep track of how many churches there are. It is a country that's been hit with disaster after disaster. And when someone offers them hope in the Lord Jesus Christ, people are accepting it. And I remember re one of the missionary leaders in the church was talking about in Haiti one month, he said, well, we had, I think it was 200 churches last month, but they were gaining usually as many as 10 a month because people were turning to Jesus. On the other hand, I knew a missionary who served in Israel, specifically uh, in the Palestinian areas. He was there for years, and they had two small churches. But, guess what? Did one work any harder than the other? Probably not. Both were doing what they could do with what was available. And they learned that by just learning to share love and hope because people are concerned about others. Wisdom tells us that we need to treat others the way God says they should be treated. I'd like us just to think this day, are we going to choose wisdom or foolishness? Are we going to give our lives to finding what God would have us to do by studying His Word, by growing in knowledge of what He has to say? Or are we going to get caught up with what's going on all around us? Let me tell you, if we get caught up in everything going on around us, it won't be long until our witness is getting less and less and less. Let us be wise, not foolish. Give our hearts to Jesus and walk in the knowledge that he gives us day in, day out. Let's bow for a moment of prayer. Precious Heavenly Father, as we come before you this morning, we would just ask that you would help us to learn to become wise, to draw closer to you, to just walk in the light of your will day in and day out. Just fill us with love for you and for one another. We're holy name we do ask it. I'd like to stand together and sing the closing hymn, To God Be the Glory.
Heavenly Father, as we go forth from this place, we ask that you will keep us down through this week, equip us to do your word, and to share your love with all we come in contact with. In your blessed holy name we do ask Amen. it. Amen.